I have quite a lot of students come from China who are fertility specialists. They told me that in China, the IVF treatment actually have two separate departments work together. One department, like me, working as a Western medicine. Another department is actually giving the patient the Chinese medicine. And the two departments working together nicely. And they said they achieved very good outcome. That was one of our guests, Dr. Yao Tama, fertility specialist, talking about his research into reproductive immunology. And you're going to hear him talking alongside Narva Carmen, a fertility acupuncturist, about how the two different approaches can work together to really understand what is going on with you and why you're not getting pregnant. The views expressed in this podcast episode are those of the guest experts and not necessarily those of the podcast hosts. When making decisions about using Chinese medicine in conjunction with IVF treatments, please Seek advice from your clinician before commencing treatment. Before we delve into what is a fascinating conversation, we've got a quick message from our sponsor. Welcome to the Fertility Podcast, where we aim to educate you and empower you in our chat so you know what to do on the next steps in your fertility journey. Now, we're living in strange times where there is a lot of uncertainty, but we hope to always give you a constant place to check into and find out new information. Kate, you and I still haven't got to see each other in person. I know, it's been ages, hasn't it? It's been way too long. And I think each time I try to put a plan in place and book a train ticket, another lockdown happens. It's like putting your sunglasses on and then the sun going in. I know, I know. Well, let's, (laughs) let's hope we can get something in soon because, yeah, we've got lots to talk about, haven't we? I'd really like it if we could see each other before the end of the year because I think we need to do a special Christmas episode in person. What do you think? We do, because if you remember last Christmas, that's exactly what we did in John Lewis. Do you remember? Yes, I remember (laughs) it very fondly. So that's our aim. Our aim is to have a a Christmas episode face-to-face. Deal? Deal. But before we get to Christmas, let's talk about our next series. So we've been talking all about the early years and the things that you wish you'd known. Now we're moving on to things into later years. So this is for you if you've been trying for a while and wondering what else might be going on. We're always, always having this conversation online as well. So make sure you follow us on our socials. I'm at Fertility Poddy. And I'm at Your Fertility Journey. Now, as you know, the Fertility Podcast is all about empowering you in the next steps in your fertility journey. And we're always delighted to find people who are on the same mission as we are. So we give a massive welcome to Merck, a new sponsor of the Fertility Podcast. They are a leading science and technology company with a rich history in the area of fertility. And with this experience, Merck has launched Bloom, a brand new website intending to provide you with information, whether you're looking to start your family or grow it and you need some help on what you're going to do next. So to find out more, just visit MerckBloom.com. So we're now going to welcome to the podcast, Narva Carmen, who is a fertility acupuncturist and founder of the Fertility Support Company. And Narva has been a guest on the podcast before, so I'll share links to our former chat. But her mission ultimately is to tackle the underlying causes of infertility and help men and women enhance their chances of conception naturally, as well as in conjunction with IVF and IUI. So welcome, Narva. Hello, thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you back. And we're also going to welcome Dr. Yao Tum, who is a fertility specialist at the Lister. Has done a lot of research in reproductive immunology, including natural killer cells, recurrent failed implantation after IVF, recurrent miscarriage of immunological origins, which is something that Kate and I, we haven't delved deep into conversations mm. about reproductive immunology. So welcome, Dr. Yao. And I know that Kate and I are both really looking forward to... Uh, to, to quizzing you more, aren't we? Yeah, I'm fascinated to chat with you, particularly surrounding natural killer cells. So yeah, we have definitely got questions. Well, let's start with, Yao, if you can explain a bit about the issues that people are presenting with, such as lupus or other diagnosed autoimmune conditions and, and how you work with them. The immune system is a very important system to uh, you know keep yourself healthy, to keep the person healthy because the immune system protects you from bacteria, from virus, which is a good thing for you. However, if the immune system is overactive, sometimes, not always, sometimes they can treat the embryo as foreign tissue. And the reason is because the embryo is not entirely genetically belong to the ladies. It carries the husband genetic material as well. 
So if the immune system is overactive, they treat the embryo as foreign tissue and start to attack it, then it will be difficult for the embryo to achieve implantations or the risk of miscarriage will be higher. However, it is important to have the immune system to control the pregnancy as well because without the immune system controlling the pregnancy, the placenta tissue will expanding too fast. So it is a balance that, you know, the immune system not too overactive but not too underactive. So it's such a fascinating area, isn't it? And I find it an area that is quite difficult to understand. And I'm sure, you know, patients particularly must find it incredibly difficult to understand. And often patients will look at so many different options when they're navigating their fertility journey. And Nava, with your experience in alternative treatments, how can alternative treatments help in, in that way too? I came to know Dr. Tum through my own working out of how Chinese medicine works in reproductive immunology. So my my area of specialty in Chinese medicine is reproductive immunology, and particularly in women 38 to 45. And I was looking around for what I felt was a missing piece. So I've seen these women who came into my clinic and they were doing all the things I thought they needed to do, but yet they were still either not falling pregnant when they really should be, or they were not staying pregnant when everything that we normally would look at, progesterone levels, endometrium, or all the things that we'd look at were fine. And so I came to understand the immune system as being this pivotal part of this picture that explained the unexplained infertility, that explained the unexplained recurrent miscarriages. And I worked on it and I worked on it. I could see I was getting better at it, but there was still, I was missing something. And I went to find Dr. Tum and I had this fantastic conversation with him in which I said, look, I've been noticing this stuff. Does this make sense to you? And he said, yes. And he explained it all. And and not just that, but I'd noticed that when I was working with people who'd even had treatment with another consultant, that there was a characteristic continuation of issues. So they were finally getting pregnant or they were finally staying pregnant with my help, with the modulation of the immune system, with the medication. But when they were staying pregnant, they were they were not healthy pregnancies. They were pregnancies that tended to be much more likely to have growth issues or preeclampsia. And the previous consultant I'd worked with had not recognized that. And I brought that to Dr. Tum and Dr. Tum said, yes, we recognize this too. We recognize that the immune system has to behave appropriately through the whole pregnancy. And his beauty as a doctor is that he's a clinician as well as a researcher. And it's just such an incredible combination. And working with him on clients we get to see the results after I've worked, but before he comes in. So we can see that Chinese medicine makes a change to the balance of the immune system, to turning down the the hyperactivation of the natural killer cells, to regulating the cytokine profile. And then he can take us home with the drugs that he can tailor for, for the clients, our own personal needs. Thank you, Nava. I have to confess that, you know, this why I'm Chinese. At the beginning, I'm not quite sure that, you know, with the Chinese medicines, or with uh, whatever, you know, not Western medicine can suppress the immune system. I know I'm Chinese, but I train as, you know, uh, Western medicine. So before that, I was always thinking that if your immune system is overactive, you always have to take all these horrible medication like steroid or IVIG or intralipid. And some patient actually said that, Dr. Tam, this is very aggressive medication. Can I do something like more simple, like change of lifestyle or Chinese medications can help to improve that? And before that, I would say, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But a few patients actually, you know, managed to find Nava and uh, have treatment with her and come back to repeat the killer cell and come back. The result was normal after that. I said, oh, what's happened? <laughs> and interestingly, the patient said that, well, actually, we went to see Nava and have uh, some Chinese medicine treatment with her. And here we are. We are better now. I said, oh, that's great. Because I'm very happy with that because if this patient's condition can improve with the m- minimum interference of you know her, her general health, it will be so good because all these medications like steroid or intralipid or IVIG is quite heavy on someone's body. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just a great example, isn't it, of the two different approaches working so well together in combination. Yeah, uh, and especially like now with the COVID situations that if I give steroid or IVIG or intralipid to suppress someone's immune system, it could be very dangerous for the patient if she get contacted with, you know, 
COVID virus. So if during these times you can do something like doing reflexology or acupuncture or Chinese medicine can improve her chance, that will be so great. Can we talk a bit more about how the Chinese medicine works then? And can you explain more about the what you've talked about, both of you, the immunomodulating and, and, and also the evidence that's available there? Well, this is fairly new stuff. I would say that the evidence is what Dr. Tam and I are seeing in our clients. I'm not sure that there's, and I'm actually, I'm not trying to tip my own here, but there's very few of us around in Chinese medicine who are working on this issue. So this is really, we're at the front of it right now. So I'd say rather than there being evidence, I'd say we're in the process of collecting it. Does that answer your question or do you want me to expand a little bit more about the technicalities of what I do? I think it's interesting for people to understand. I mean, obviously not in too complicated a way because I know there's a lot that goes on. But just to help if people are considering this and and they don't really understand how the Chinese medicine can add to the mix. Okay, so I work at it two ways. Firstly, I take a really, really detailed history. Uh, Usually takes me 60 to 90 minutes to take that history. It's a really in-depth one. And you'd never believe the things that can be significant to me. So if somebody, for example, has had really severe food poisoning in their 20s and had a parasite, that in itself, I now understand, can kick off a process in the immune system that can pretty linear way actually lead to fertility problems. But I'd understand and translate that into Chinese medicine. I'd look at what we call retained pathogen. I'd look at blood stasis. I'd look at the things in Chinese medicine that I could do to solve that problem and treat them accordingly. And then I use the other arm of what I have, which is all the testing that Yao has taught me to do and that I send clients to him to do. I look at those tests. I look at his analysis of those tests. And I look at how activated the killer cells are, what the Th1, Th2 cytokine profile are, Th1 and Th2 being two different bits of the immune system which I can elaborate on later if you want me to, but I look at how those are are doing. And again, I translate that into Chinese medicine and I treat and then I retest and recheck and then we wait to see the result. That's fascinating because it's something that, you know, over the years, the combination of alternative therapies working alongside traditional medicine, westernized medicine, you know, that it's becoming more and more accepted Dr. Tom, I'm just quite interested. Do you still see some resistance within the fertility sector? And if you do, how can patients go about finding a consultant that actually is more open to that type of way of working? I I think the main thing is fears of unknown because for fertility treatment is sadly is quite expensive and also quite uh, stressful for the couple. As a clinician, we want to do everything, anything to make sure that the patient has the optimum chance to achieve a positive outcome. And if anything, uncertainty add into the treatment as a clinician, we get worried. So as a clinician, we we do not know Chinese medicine very well. And we just worry that whatever Chinese medicine adding during the treatment or before the treatment can interfere with the medication we gave, like the stimulation drugs or the estrogen or the progesterone pathway and so forth and so on. That what we worry. So in order to eliminate that worry, we say that, okay, I'll prefer you not to take any Chinese medicine during IVF treatment cycle. But saying so, I have quite a lot of students come from China well, fertility specialist, and they told me that in China, the IVF treatment actually have two separate departments work together. One department, like me, working as a Western medicine, and another department is actually giving the patient the Chinese medicine, and the two departments working together nicely. And they said they achieve very good outcome. So, I wish, I wish as a Chinese, I know more about Chinese medicine, but I'm not. (laughs) So I I think in order to make things better, I would say education is the more important. Like if a clinician like myself willing to open up and uh, learn more about Chinese medicine or or go to like talk from Nawa or any, any practitioner that to understand more, then we will be able to work together better for the patient. Mm, Absolutely. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's that joined up working. With regards to your research into natural killer cells, it's an area that fascinates me. And I know there's been quite a lot of interest and quite a lot of press coverage on all of this. 
Can you explain the controversy surrounding NK cells with regards to uterine and blood? Yeah, that is very, very important topic to discuss. Quite often my patient asks me that question as well. And they say that, okay, what's the difference between the uterine NK cell and the blood NK cell? My answer is there's no difference because all the NK cell is produced in the bone marrow. After the NK cell produced in bone marrow, they travel everywhere in our body, to the, our, to the lungs, to the gut, to the uterus, everywhere to protect us. Okay, so after the killer cell produced in bone marrow, they go into the blood, then they go into the uterus. And so, yes, we can do tests with uh, endometrium biopsy to get some of the NK cell in the uterus to check whether the, the, the number is high or not. But the problem is to perform a uterine biopsy, a clean uterine biopsy is very difficult. Quite often the biopsy is full of blood. I did quite a lot of uterine NK cell research as well, and quite often my sample was rejected by my uh, laboratory, said that this sample is not clean because it's full of blood. They do not know that killer cell they're looking at is belong to the blood or belong to the uterus. So it's difficult to get, get a clean sample for research, number one. And number two, when the woman have a period, they will shed out all the lining, including all the NK cell within the lining. So there is an argument that, you know, I'm checking the lining, NK cell in this cycle may not represent what will happen in your next cycle. This is what we call intercycle variations. Whereas compared to the, the NK cell in the blood, which is pretty constant, and you can get good amount of killer cell in the blood to do more testing and investigation and research. And the main hypothesis is if the killer cell in the blood are overactive or aggressive toward the pregnancy tissue, and if these killer cell move or migrate into the uterus, those killer cell can cause damage to the pregnancy or to, to achieve a pregnancy. So yes, I'm, I'm still doing quite a lot of research on uh, uterine NK cell, but the peripheral blood NK cell is more stable to do testing and treatment. And, and okay, so why do you think then that, for example, the HFEA have put that as a red traffic light for the blood NK cell testing as opposed to uterine? Is it because there's not the research to support it at the moment? Why, why would you say that that's the case? Um, there is a, a lot of research been done either by myself or by other uh, research group in America or Japan or Spanish group. Okay. And if you go to the medical publication website called PubMed and you type in reproductive immunology or NK cell, you will get about 2,000 publications about this topic. The problem is with the immune system, it's quite complicated. And reproductive immunology is part of the uh, fertility treatment but it's actually a different branch of medicine. As a fertility doctor, if we do not know the immune system very well, it potentially we can give the patient wrong treatment or unnecessary treatment. That is why the HFEA gives the red line, so that you need to discuss with the consultant in detail about this treatment, and the consultant needs to explain to you, is it really benefit for your case or not, and explain all the side effects or the risk of the treatment and so forth and so on before uh, the patient embark on reproductive immunity okay. treatment. Okay, thank you for explaining that. And Narva, do you have anything to add to that at all? What are your thoughts on NK cells? I absolutely do. And without naming any names, I want to be quite specific in my response. I looked a long time for Dr. Tum. I looked for a man with his high standard of ethics and his ability to research and explain so clearly to patients. And he also did something, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but he did something that I've never seen a consultant do before, which is to call a patient and say, you know what, you're fine, you don't need to come in, all your results are normal. I've never knowingly, I've never known a consultant to knowingly turn down a client from coming in and not charging them, which tells you a lot about my person well, years. <laughs> well, so because for fertility treatment is stressful enough, you know, you, you, you're talking about time stress, and financial stress as well. So if I can reduce the stress for yeah. the patients, I would want to do that. Yeah, we're all for the stress reduction. 
I had experience with immune treatment from lots of different clinics. And I'm, I should say, I'm based in London, so I'm familiar with all the, all the main London clinics. And there's one very large, very well-known clinic who doesn't do very accurate testing, does very old-style testing. And literally each test they do costs a thousand pounds and they repeat that test multiple times and each time they give the same treatment at, or, or variations of treatment that's not based on the cytokine assay that Dr. Tum does that is specific to the client. They just give it, they, it feels like they pull it out of thin air half the time. And then there are other clients in other IVF clinics, I can think of two off the top of my head now, that just give everybody steroids because they think it's a thing to do. And the clients who've come into me from having that experience, I can look at the paperwork, I can look at the past history of all the treatments they've had, and I can say to them, look, we don't actually know, despite all this testing, we don't actually know, A, if you've got a problem, because the testing's not good enough, and B, we don't know if you've been given the right drug. And 99 times out of 100, when we redo the test, either they don't have a problem, or they do have a problem, and they've been given a drug that they will have zero reaction to. So they'll have been given IVIG instead of a steroid or they'll have been given intralipids instead of IVIG. And these are three different beasts. They work in different ways. They cost different amounts of money. And sometimes you need the lightest of light touches, and sometimes you need a heavy hitter, but it depends on the person. So not all clinics are created equal by any means. It's always a tricky one when we have conversations like this, because obviously the aim of the podcast is to kind of empower people in the in the decisions that they're making. And when People often put their trust into the clinics that they're going to because they just don't know anything other. But this is why this podcast performs such an important function, that information function, that what you do to demystify and explain makes the difference. I've had feedback to say from clients who listen to a podcast, it makes the difference between success and failure, that knowledge and the empowerment that knowledge brings them. So with that in mind, though, Nava, if someone's listening and we're talking about the impact this treatment has on things like implantation, and you you mentioned earlier about the effect it has on on the baby's future. And obviously, we want people to not listen to stuff and then start freaking out and not trusting where they are having treatment. But what things would you be thinking about the questions that they need to be asking if they if there, there are some of these issues that we've been talking about, and they're not feeling that maybe they are feeling that they are being given a bit of a one size fits all approach? What would your advice be? I would ask them whether they're doing live blood or serum analysis. I would ask them how do they know the right drug to be given based on the results they're getting. I mean, those two questions are pretty pertinent, especially the latter one, because you want the doctor to have a really good rationale based on that particular person's physiological makeup for giving the drugs they're giving. Yes, now while you touch a very, very important point is I totally disagree that some clinicians said just I'll give you the steroid, we suppress your immune system and you'll be fine. From all my patients, quite a lot of them actually steroid not able to suppress the immune system for that particular patient. So without doing the test, without knowing which medication is suitable for the patient and just give the steroid, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Yes, as now I said, maybe, you know, the patient's immune system is not overactive at all. Then in that case, why you, you want to give the patient the steroid? And also, I'm happy to help the patients. I know some of the, my patients travel quite far away, come and see me. I'm happy to help the patient, you know, do the testing and make sure that is there any immune issue or not. And the patient should go back to her local clinic to have, have the treatment because, you know, local clinic is more convenient for the patients and they, you know, build up the relationship already. It's not necessary you have to come to me to have IVF treatment in order to test your immune system. I, as a clinician, I help any patient, not just IVF patients. Okay. And when it comes to patients who have experienced implantation failure and recurrent miscarriage, do you give the same advice or is it do you tailor your advice differently? What would you recommend to those patients? Because clearly there are an awful lot of them and I see an awful lot of them. Usually for those patients, I will ask them to, you know, book in for a consultation with me and get all the test results she had before with her previous clinic and all the IVF data as well. So I will look through all the data in, in great detail and I will explain that, you know, basically if it's recurring field implantation, there's two main factors, either problem with the embryo or problem on the, the lady's side. So I will have to look through, is it an embryo factor? Do we need to do any like genetic testing on the couple or sperm DNA fragmentation and so forth and so on? 
and then I look into the woman uh, side. Is there any problem with the uterus? Any problem with the hormone system, progesterone level, and immune system and clotting system, and so forth and so on. So, which is a very detailed, very detailed analysis on that case. Then from there, I will make a suggestions. What should we do next? Should we do more tests or so far and so? And I'd on. gobble up all that information that <laughs> and I take it and I translate it into Chinese medicine and be able to treat the patient alongside it because that level of information is so useful. So when we're talking about time frames as well, because again, the point of what we try to do with the podcast is to is to highlight that these changes can be made and are worth trying to implement before going into treatment because so many people feel that they're told they need to have treatment and they're pushed through the doors. And when we're looking at, you know, utilizing what the pair of you are saying and, and, and like I say, implementing it, is there a kind of a minimum amount of time that you really need to be trying to look at this before heading back into treatment or starting treatment? We need treatment? a minimum of three months as far as I'm concerned, because all this has yeah. epigenetic yeah. implications. You know, if you're not healthy or you're, the healthier you are, the healthier your children will be, very simple. And it takes three months for things to change uh, environmentally in the body, immunologically. So the egg quality and the, and the, the respon- ovarian responsiveness changes. It takes 100 days or three months for a sperm to change. We just need enough time to do the work. And, yeah, I know that there's changes afoot to start investigating miscarriages after two rather than three. Is that something that you're, you're starting to do already at the Lister? Or do you see that happening shortly? Well, at the list, uh, we still follow the national guideline. And so as a clinician, we need to, you know, follow the college guideline and national guidelines for our practice. Quite often, you have to give the patient informed choice what they want to do. And some patients, after two miscarriage, and then you talk to the patient and they say that, okay, if in your next pregnancy, the risk of miscarriage is higher, but there's still a very good chance you achieve a baby without further investigations and some patients will want to do that but another patient will say that look I I hear what you said Dr. Tan but miscarriage for me is so stressful emotionally and also costs a lot of time as well and I want to do more tests before I embark on another IVF treatment which is very costly as well so usually I will give the patient options and also I will inform the patient that what is the current national guideline and I let the patient make the de- decision to do or not to do the test. And are you hopeful that the national guidelines will change to allow more investigation after two? Um, hope is not the thing, this, uh, uh, the right word for me. I think we need to educate each other and listen to each other and make the right guideline for the patient. Good answer. Mm, sound advice. Yeah. Thank you both. It's been really interesting. I think we've um, gathered a lot of insight to hopefully give people things to think about. And we'll put obviously links to you, Narva, and then then through Narva, people can find you, Dr. Yao. And Narva, you are an acupuncturist. I know you're working in a different way now, but you have a whole kind of team of, of acupuncturists who have the accreditation that you've created. And, and we're always keen again to, to signpost people in the right place when it comes to if they are interested in finding a fertility acupuncturist. So just tell me how that kind of works, because you've now got this certification, haven't you? And you, you constantly have this training for I people. I do. And I've come to think of that training actually as my life's work and centered around consumer safety, actually. I wanted to create a group of people that knew what I knew. I've downloaded 20 years of my own experience to a core curriculum. And while they pay for that training, they do not pay to renew that certification or to have my logo. They pay once and that's it. And then they renew it on proof of continuing professional development. So there's a group of people who work with me. You can find them on my website who have all the information I have. We're a part of a community and we're constantly updating our our education. We do monthly professional development work and what I know, they know. So you're safe in their hands. So if you want someone who's fertility support trained, call and ask if that acupuncturist has my training. Ask if they're fertility support trained because it means that they are all going to be reproductive immunology specialists. They're all going to understand the Western medicine and how to train it, translate it into Chinese medicine. They're all going to be clinically experienced and they're all going to be really good at Chinese medicine too. So you'll be safe in their hands. 
Again, we'll put the links in the show notes so people can, can find you as the starting point. Yeah, it's easy to say you're a fertility acupuncturist, but if you don't, you know, you can literally come out of college and call yourself that. But actually having that background, you know, that's the thing that I wanted to create and I wanted to empower clients to know how to ask for it. And that's so important, Ava. I know, you know, for me personally, when I do recommend acupuncture to my patients, I always say to them, go and find a fertility acupuncturist because they need to have that knowledge. I think it's so vitally important. So I will definitely be putting ladies your way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions on anything we've talked about here, pop us an email to info at the fertilitypodcast.com. We'd also love it if you can rate, review, subscribe and share this podcast, which you can do in your favourite podcast app. I think the easiest one to do it in, though, is Apple Podcasts. And it's always so good to hear from you and it really helps others knowing that we're worth listening to. Thank you, as always, for your support. And until the next time...